Hi, and welcome to our Capital Connection podcast. My name is Steve Torsa. I'm the founder of Wholesale Investor and also Capital HQ. Today we have with us Mr. Alan Hunter, who is the founder of NRN, the National Renewable Network. Welcome, Alan. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. i always happy to have you on. So just as a, as a starting point, could you provide a bit of an introduction to yourself sort of prior to, to NRN? Yeah, definitely. Um, look, my my whole career has been in the startup world, seeking you know, what's what's the next opportunity. I was very very fortunate um, to get involved or, or at the very beginning of a of a car rental business for Uber drivers uh, called Splend. Uh, there was a, a Uber just launched into the market in 2015. Um, there was such a, a gap in the market with demand of, of Uber riders and not enough drivers, but those there was a lot of people that are unemployed and had a driver's license. So you kind of put the two, two and two together. Um, that was a, really the big start of my startup career was uh, um, was I guess working and building in uh, that that organisation. Uh, and uh, looking back now, it's uh, um, it had global expansion, and uh, yeah, it took it took the it, it grew very very quickly. Let's just say. Well, what I what I love when I first heard of Splend. Now, funny, most people wouldn't know we actually shared an investor at one stage. In that Investec was an investor in Splend and also an investor into into wholesale investor. But what I really loved about Splend is effectively you could see the trend of Uber taking over from a you know from a transportation perspective, and also it was very well known about the issues that they had where you know there's obviously people who want to be drivers but they couldn't afford you know couldn't afford the cars. So I, I suppose for yourself, what is it do you think about you as far as your mind, as far as how you can observe what's happening from a consumer trend perspective, then also understand the issues on the, the supply side and then the creation of the business model? Like how does your mind sort of process that? Yeah, good question. Look, for, for me, I, I worked really heavy with the drivers. Um, I think the first hundred drivers, I could tell you their full names. I could tell you about their families. I really got to get to know our first customers. And I, I think that's the start of any any business model. It's, it's you know, you can go away, you can build spreadsheets, you can build a concept, but if you're not actually talking to the people that's going to buy your product, then uh, how, how can you scale and build it out? So I think that was really, really valuable for me um, during that period of time. And of course, I've, I've, I've been able to then to implement those experiences into what, what I do today. Yeah, interesting. And, you know, for, for you now, obviously, you went from Splend, you saw that trend taking place, and then obviously you went and founded NRN. When did you found NRN? So it was about four years ago. I got really interested into the renewable space. Um, I saw there was a uh, a growing market. There's this, you know, big tailwinds coming from governments around this transition. Um I knew nothing about this industry. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you what the unit of a kilowatt hour, which is a unit of electricity, was back then. Um, and, and obviously that had to change. But uh, um, when I first stepped into this market, I wanted to understand, well, what does that transition look like and where, where are the gaps? And the, the big gap that I, uh, I identified and I wanted to challenge was that we, we rely on people to buy the infrastructure Um which was which was strange for me. I didn't have to buy a power station to power my home. Why do I need to have buy rooftop solar to to have access to renewable? And for me, that was the beginning of the journey to go. Well, how do I make rooftop solar and batteries for homes accessible for everyone, but without them having to purchase it? And what were some of the consumer and demographic trends that you were sort of observing as far as how people purchased it? Yeah, it was in the very early days. It was definitely those who were well, not able to access it because of cost, finance, yeah. didn't own a home, uh, and, and really trying to break those barriers down. Uh, and I think once we started to build out the product, and uh, I can go further into what the product is uh, in a moment, but once it, we started to build out, we actually started opening up doors to different types of demographics, people that we didn't even expect to uh, to have on board. And they, they, you know, we, we've been able to support people that are, low-income household renters to someone that owns a five million dollar home uh, and um we've we've identified that we're actually um it's it's a product that's attractive for for all different types of demographics 
I was going to say, like when you were sort of initially starting your business plan, did you have this sort of in mind sort of for millennials and Gen Z? Was that the sort of target focus as a starting point, just given that you know, there's obviously a strong uh, demand you know, from them from a purchasing power to, to purchase sort of renewable or to be you know, involved in, I suppose, in you know, basic contribution in some way? Yeah, look, definitely. I think there was, um, I actually remember the, fir- the first customer I had spoken to and uh, where, I, where I got the driver to create this accessible for everyone it was actually a pensioner. So it was the other side of the scale okay. where they, they really wanted to decrease their electricity bill. They didn't have the means to to access renewable. And I, I got a bit frustrated of why why they couldn't do it. They, they we weren't accepted for finance and um, they were just blocked to have Act, or well, just to be exposed to the uh, increasing of energy costs. So that, um, I went away from that and I was like, right, how, how, do, how do I help this one individual first? How do I get a, you know, allow him to access renewable from, from his home, uh, which evidently is a lot cheaper, um, but make sure that it's if there's an ecosystem that covers the cost and there's no cost to him, just a, a cheaper bill. And then, of course, we, we start then looking at the different types of demographics and uh, every single person pays for electricity. So the uh, it's quite a... Quite a large yeah. market, and just from your perspective, you know, you think about sort of solar solar energy as a you know, a, a, I suppose as something that we can purchase. Where do you see adoption? And you, sorry, you think about adoption trends of actually mm. solar across from the consumer's perspective. Where where do where does Australia currently sit from an adoption of solar? We're one of the biggest in the world. Like that, um, you know, we we've got an adoption rate of thirty four percent of homes now have rooftop solar. Wow. It's it's such a it's such a great achievement. Um, but I guess on the the other hand, we are first hand experiencing the the challenges that that has. The, you know, we thirty four percent is around. 3.4, 3.5 million homes in Australia have um, have rooftop solar, uh, and and with the, the challenge that we we uh, we've learned now is that that means there's 3.5 million people that own generation assets within our energy market, and that's starting to cause a lot of problems in our energy market, and it's actually opened up more opportunity for our business model and and our product uh, for consumers, but also more for the energy sector. And that's, uh, that's a big focus for us going into the next year. I was going to say that that does lead on to the next question I had for you. Like, how do those trends actually impact the current energy market and uh, I suppose the role of traditional energy retailers? Huge, huge. Like the um, energy was always, um, it was a, it was a A to Z supply chain. It was one directional from a generation to, to someone using it. Uh, we now have this bi-directional energy transaction that's coming from a household and from a generation, and then someone needs to be able to manage it in the middle. Uh, and it's it's genuinely causing a lot of havoc. Uh, we've we've seen and experienced um, energy prices increase and volatility. And I genuinely think a lot of that is contributed to roof, from rooftop solar uh, and and and. Uh, really, it's around the lack of management of that power, and we're we're starting to see some some challenges at the moment. For me, I think all our lives we get conditioned that you know energy is a or carbon based energy is obviously a, a, a finite resource. You know, we sort of had that condition yeah. to it, and then obviously renewable has that capacity to be a, an infinite uh, energy source. But really, uh, I suppose the difference. Uh, between that sort of potential and capacity is technology and its role in sort of converting sort of nature or natural resources into energy. Yeah. For me, like uh, I, I suppose, and you mentioned about how they in sort of cr- increased price uh, in energy at the moment. What do you see as far as for like how do you see the overarching trend uh, from sort of supply, demand, cost of energy, et cetera, over the next five to 10 years? But I there's there's two aspects we look at. There's the cost of energy, which I think we're going to get to a point where I would like to think the energy side is going to stabilize a bit. I think we we are experiencing such volatility because of the the um, heavy adoption of renewable energy. Uh, renewable is a huge variable generation um, or generator versus um, a coal-fired power station or other other generation assets, which is a very strong base load. So that's why we're yeah. starting to see these fluctuations happening. But it's more on the other side. We're a very vast and large country. The poles and wires to move electricity isn't getting cheaper. And I think that's where we're going to start experiencing as consumers the, the future increase of electric electricity prices. It's not the actual electron or the energy. It's it's more around the infrastructure to move that electricity around. Uh, and it's uh 
it, it will be really fascinating to watch networks um, who, who own the poles and wires to, to how their business models evolve over the next few years as we introduce community batteries and introduce microgrids and all these other mm. future of energy um, features, but someone needs to pay for that infrastructure. And I, I can't see consumer energy decreasing anytime soon uh, because of the, 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 the infrastructure costs that's required to, uh, to take us to the next step. Interesting. You know, I was, I was, uh, one, I was a couple of years ago, I was doing a, a session with a, one of our clients and they mentioned, I can't remember the exact four stages, but effectively the last two stages that they sort of uh, articulated of how sort of, and it, like you've got the current energy set up where you said there's significant distance of between power stations and the actual homes. And the next stage yeah. would be, I can't remember the, the second stage actually, but the third stage would be effectively microgrids in sort of local areas, but ultimately where it would get to is people being, you know, basically power, you know, having their own energy source via their homes, et cetera. Is that yeah. sort of how you see the, the the transition over the next sort of few decades? Yeah, I, I do. But then I we also challenge like who who controls the energy and for the benefit of whom. Um, energy yeah. or electricity has always been a collective. It's been we we install one large generation asset, and it's to support hundreds of thousands of homes. We've now yeah. moved to a world where people are buying electricity generation assets like rooftop solar for their sole purpose. So when we start looking at microgrids or local energy networks, these are another buzzwords with virtual power plants, there's this huge conflict of going, well, who's managing that energy and to the benefit of who and who's paying for that infrastructure to be installed? And I think that's where we see our business model thriving is, is removing that cost barrier for consumers of saying we install solar and battery in your home it doesn't cost you anything at all but in 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 uh in compromise of that we're going to manage that energy to accommodate the energy sector to then receive you cheaper bills on the other side and i think that's that's something we've seen um over the past few years and, and i can see that being more important um as time goes on so so far we've talked about obviously the trends that are taking place and and, and so forth like what i'd love to understand now is you know i suppose you we've talked about how your observation of it, what you're seeing is happening. What is the product that you've created from from the NRM perspective, and you know, uh, and and then effectively, who are your customers? You know, a, a, as part of this. Yeah, it's uh, look. The product always starts um, at the the end of our supply chain, which is always around the, the consumer. And when we started, it was like, how do we solve a problem for the consumer? And I think as the products evolve, we've identified all the different problems and, uh, you know, ha- as, as what, what problems are we trying to solve? And really where we're at today is, is our business model is, is to support energy retailers to develop energy plans that include solar and battery for their consumers. And, uh, we, we believe that in the next 12, 18 months, most energy retailers in our, in Australia will offer solar and battery for free as bundled in your energy plan, but with a compromise that they can use that energy and manage it in accordance to their portfolio. And I think we we're starting that. We've we it's been fascinating seeing the um, the interest and demand from energy retailers. Um, they have a bigger role to play now. Uh, let's say five, 10 years ago, an energy retailer was a billing agent. They just, mm. they're a settlement between energy market and consumer. And now there's such a bigger role to play. So where our customer are energy retailers um, and on the other side of the fence, uh, our, uh, our customers also solar retailers. So we've, um, we're really seeing a shift in the solar retailer industry at the moment. And the, the this whole transition towards energy management and battery storage we, we, we're really putting ourselves in the forefront of, of um, supporting the solar industry as, and aligning it with them with the energy sector. So just the, so I know one of the, the questions we're going to have is, uh, I've got one of my notes that obviously Diamond Energy, who is an old client of Wholesale Investor, is uh, also a client of yours. Why do they, like when they come to you, what drives them and what motivates them to do business with you? Look, uh, I think Diamond Energy was a, an incredible, um, incredible customer experience working with them. They're all about renewable. So any product that's going to help consumers access renewable, um, mm. the door is wide open. So, you know, what there, there's, that's obviously a really big driver is how do we help customers stop using fossil fuel uh, and, yeah. and become more independent? And I think what we learned through this whole process is, is the 
this whole conflict of energy management, when a customer doesn't own a system, you have more control of that system. I, I, I'd love to present you an example. Mm-hmm. Um, September this year, uh, sorry, last year, um, uh, in Victoria, we experienced many negative pricing events. So this means that any generator, any generator would have to pay the market to take your energy away, right? Because we had too much energy during those period of times. Um, there are... Uh, I guess retailers putting things in place where they want to what we call curtail a solar system. So that's turning off someone's solar system because there's too much export and it's costing them money. They're losing money for anything that's exported to the grid at that time. Now, if you bought a solar system and your energy retailer is turning off your system so you can't export, you're you're really disincentivized. So I think what we're seeing now through these trends is, is that if an energy retailer removes that conflict of interest from not allowing um, customers not having to buy the assets, they are. I would love to ex- like think about that. They are more profitable. They they are, they they are reducing their risk profile. They're not having to pay money to the market uh, because it's unmanaged generation. So we're seeing we're seeing a big shift from the energy sector when we when we think about what we call the uh, distributed energy resources. So effectively for you, Alan, you've created a little mini marketplace for yourself that sort of sits between, uh, I suppose, the energy retailers, the energy su- supplies or the the solar the, the solar sort of supplies. You've created this sort of middle market for yourself. Yeah. And to date, you've raised from a, you, to date, you've raised, is it 13 and a half million? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah we've raised 13 and a half million to date. Um, there's, there's 10 of that that's... Um, up to ten that's going to be structured for 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 debt essentially to to keep buying our infrastructure uh, and and within the organisation we. When you say infrastructure, what is that infrastructure you're buying? Solar and battery systems that sit on people's homes today, um, and that's that's our I guess that's a platform that we've now built out. Uh, we've raised three and a half million in equity to to be able to build the. Uh, um, I guess the foundations in the organization. Uh, and, and last year I would kind of express that it was our, our year of testing. Like it's like you build all these models in a spreadsheet, you look at your your demand curves and everything else, and you know, you, you go in with assumptions. But I think last year was was really evident to us that we've got something really incredible here. And the the platform we've created, um, it can serve hundreds of thousands, if not millions. And it's also a product that, that's very, very scalable because there are solar retailers and there's energy retailers all across the world that's going to face problems that they don't even know about yet that is, Australia is is facing today. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where we're at today. Yeah, interesting. And as far as from a revenue perspective, how do you guys make money from this transaction? Yeah, so we we're a, in a way, in a way we're a four way marketplace. So, you know, we 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 have this little diagram that we look at where we have our we have investors that um, uh, can actually own the assets and we take an asset management fee from it. We also have different funding structures internally and we we obviously take clips through the middle of that. Um, when a solar retailer deplo- deploys a site, we have a deployment fee that that's that keeps us going. But we also have recurring revenue for the next twenty years from the energy retailer. For the infrastructure that's deployed, so that that turns that keeps the lights on, uh, but also helps us grow. Um, and it's I think in the early stage of a business, you know, you you can't go and solve your entire commercialization model for growth. Like you you know what you've got today, and I think there's a there's a good scope for what additional commercial models we can introduce into the organization later on um, down the line. But really for us, it's uh you know, once an asset's deployed, we have revenue for the next 20 years that, that will keep coming in from it. Um, and, and I guess it comes from the energy retailer side. As far as with the, the solar retailers, how do you yeah. sort of, uh, I suppose, win their, win their bids or win their, win, win yeah. their business? So that was a big change we made uh, last year, Steve. It was about, about 10 months ago, I'd say. We, we felt yeah. like we were really competing against the solar industry. In Australia, we have mm. 4,500 solar installers, and there are 30,000 solar systems that get installed every month. And uh, you know our product was competing against the traditional way of buying solar. Um, so we, we made a big shift in our business to go, and hang on, we, you know, are, do we want to compete against this or do we work with them? And we've been able to go to market um, to solar retailers and build a product for them. And it's um, it's a product that I'm really proud of. Uh, there's, we're solving a lot of problems for solar retailers. They're a, they're a transactional organization. They, they have to chase the next sale to keep the lights mm-hmm. on and pay payroll. Uh, we've developed a model where we're sharing our recurring revenue uh, to the solar retailers and making sure they have a very um, solid margin uh, to make sure that they they, are, they remain profitable. We're in a uh, we're in a very competitive uh, industry in the solar space where 
everyone is trying to beat each other on price and it is becoming a race to the bottom. So with this product, there is no price. Customer doesn't pay anything. We have a very fixed fee structure with our solar retailer partners. Uh, and it's uh, so far, it's, it's been really, really successful with them. And Alan, like obviously you're building this as a commercial model for yourself and you're, you know, obviously you're a founder, so you want to build a business, create as much value for yourself and, and shareholders as part of the process. From an investor's perspective, looking at this entire space, looking at the consumer trends, looking at, you know, mentioning about how there's been so far 34% adoption, where do you see, like if you were to put your investor hat on, where is the money to be made in this space and what type of financial opportunities are available and where should investors be looking at to gain returns? I, I genuinely think hard physical infrastructure is 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 the next thing. Like there's a, you know, people, as we approach the 20, 2030 deadlines, uh, I think we're going to start seeing some very large organisations stressing out trying to, to, to get some level of, uh, of renewable infrastructure in place. I think we found ourselves in a really interesting market and, and somewhere where it's going to be, I believe, a lot of demand, uh, whereby people want to own renewable energy infrastructure. It, there's, a, there's a good, there's a solid return on it. There's, I guess, an infinite amount of energy that's going to be created or stored or how, however that's done. You know, there's obviously mm -hmm. mass that sits behind it. Um, but, but yeah, I, I really think here in this space, hard infrastructure is, is going to be key. We, we, you know, there's that side, and then there's what you do with the energy, the energy management side, virtual power plants, all of that is quite, that's the sexy, cool stuff, uh, you know, and I, and I think there's, mm. a, there's a lot of great companies out there doing a lot of that, but I think without the infrastructure, you can't have all those all those sexy, cool stuff. So, yeah, I just, I believe hard assets of renewable energy infrastructure is a, is a really interesting um, outlook for, for investors. But the, I guess on the back of that, it's making sure that it's deployable and it's scalable. To deploy one yeah. asset isn't that interesting. It's, uh, you know, I, I just made a statement that 30,000 solar systems are installed every month in Australia. That mm. is, there is a market, there is there's a workforce that does that. It's not easy to tap into. Uh, and it's it's about how does one, one scale? Because on a spreadsheet, it can look really good. Uh, but in reality, it's it's pretty tough. What's really interesting is you you've created a unique model where you've got that combine of there's a there's a there's a investment yield there's a there's a yield sort of mm. opportunity in the actual in in the assets, then you've got the combination of the the energy from the the, the energy and correct me if I'm wrong the energy supply aspect and then obviously there's just the general up growth upside potential in the actual business as well. Yeah, and it's it's a real network effect. Um, yeah. When we think about energy management, if you're managing two systems, you don't create a lot of um, alternative revenue stream. If you're connect, if you're controlling connecting two hundred thousand systems, the alternative revenue streams you're able to generate is quite significant. And I think that's you know, that will then pass on to our energy retailers as, as as our customers, and that will then provide consumers cheaper bills. And I think we're going to create this this uh, yeah this network effect whereby the more systems we have, the more revenue goes through the funnel, creating cheaper bills for consumers, attracting more people. And, and I think that's what we want to start seeing over the next few years. Brilliant. Well, Alan, thank you so much for your time. Congratulations, said I know I know you've just been recently written up in in the AFR, and you've written, and you've been covered by sort of all sorts of different industry publications. You've been invited to speak on to speak at different events around the world as well. So, congratulations to you and, and your success in in building the business. We we look forward to to working with you and and basically, you know, I, I said just continue to see that growth because we we also we're big believers in the potential for renewable energy infrastructure over time, um, especially when you see all the different thematic changes, the technology uh, advancements, and also just general consumer habits, government uh, investment, and also even the way funds are investing into this space, you're really in a prime position to take advantage of a whole bunch of trends that are sort of converging at one time. Yeah, no, we are, and it's... Uh... It's all about execution now, so it's uh, yeah. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no pressure at all. Brilliant. Well, thanks again, Alan, for your time. Thank we you. really appreciate it. Look forward to following your story. Thank you very much. Thanks for the time, Steve.